Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Chapter 6, Counterculture Elder As American military involvement in Vietnam escalated, the new left shifted from demanding participatory democracy to protesting the war. On April 17, 1965, SDS held an anti-war demonstration in Washington, D.C. The showing of 25,000 was unexpectedly large. Against the advice of their old left elders, SDS heirs had decided to allow progressive labor, the Maoist group, to participate. Why be so exclusive? They wondered. What could go wrong? Meanwhile the whole youth revolt was becoming totalistic in Allen's sense, favoring cultural and psychological as well as political liberation. Rock and roll and a new generational self-awareness were inspiring not simply bohemians but multitudes of young people to shake off social conventions. Starting in California in November 1965, they gathered in large venues under strobe lights, drank acid-spiked punch, and danced with abandon. LSD, these hippies believed, could tap into the interior spaces of personality and unlock their natural, spontaneous selves, and those selves were peaceful and communal. If enough people underwent the psychedelic experience, it could solve the problems of humankind, leading to revolutionary social and political change. In 1966 and 1967, hippies streamed into the Lower East Side, supplanting the earlier Bohemians, bringing with them a new kind of alternative culture, living together in communes. The younger New York Federized too donned hippie garb and consumed LSD enthusiastically, considering it a revolutionary tool for the liberation of the psyche. They incorporated sexual radicalism with all our other radicalism, Gardner told me. Many members of the commune experimented with sexual freedom. Book Chin didn't wear hippie clothes, he stuck to his usual plaid or polyester shirts and olive drab field jacket. He kept his hair short and his face shaved. And he stayed aloof from the sexual experimentation. I don't recall Murray being lovers with anybody, recalled Gardner. Sexually, he preferred emotional intimacy to promiscuity. My sexual life was guided by my feelings, he later told an interviewer. But even as he stayed aloof from counterculture practices, he admired the beautiful innocence in his friends' glowing faces and trusting behavior, seeing in it the potential for a profound social transformation. Rebellious youth had disavowed money and commodities and dropped out of a destructive culture, they had embraced the values of cooperation and communality. It was an ethical revolt, and their values could possibly fulfill the promise of the new technology guiding it toward liberatory uses rather than wasteful or destructive ends. An ethically grounded youth movement, he thought, might achieve the role that Marx had assigned to the proletariat, as the agent of broad social revolution. Young people might lack a socially revolutionary consciousness, but they could learn, and he would cultivate it in his young friends. What irritated him was the drugs. At political meetings, joints would come out, and then next thing he knew, people wouldn't be talking anymore, they were looking at their feet. The New York Federation never did publish a second issue of Good Soup because the Federa who was supposed to handle it was too stoned. Nor did he agree that psychedelic drugs could lead to revolutionary social transformation, they were devices for mere sensation, for formless states of mind. Personally he said, I like clarity of thinking, so I would not take LSD. By 1965 hippies were flooding into SDS, the largest new left and anti-war organization, bringing with them a preference for sex, drugs, and rock and roll over politics and demonstrations. At SDS's June 1965 National Convention at Key Wade in Michigan, the many sensual distractions made focused discussion difficult. Those who tried to present position papers were ignored, those who tried to provide leadership were shrugged off as elitist. In a Dionysian haze, the participants voted to allow communists to join SDS. No sooner had they done so than progressive labor burst in, having waited a long time to enter the fast-growing student anti-war organization. Clean-cut and disciplined, 
these Maoists had studied the Chinese and Cuban revolutions and now were prepared to assume the role of the new left's vanguard. While other SDS heirs merely demanded American withdrawal from Vietnam, PLERS actively supported the struggle of the Viet Cong against the imperialist aggressor, now they would turn SDS's orientation from anti-war to pro-Viet Cong. They diligently formed clubs on campuses to attract student supporters. PL grew because it projected an image of fearless militants, noted one observer. Traditional Marxism seemed to be infecting an old hero of Bookchin's as well. In 1966 Herbert Marcuse spoke at the NYU Law School, where Murray was stunned to hear the author of Reason and Revolution and Eros and Civilization mouthing a crudely orthodox Marxist class analysis. According to this new incarnation of Marcuse the peasant-based anti-colonial revolts constituted a globalized proletariat that was even now rising up against the globalized bourgeoisie, the wealthy industrialized nations. Book Chin met him here and perhaps chided him for returning to Marxist formulas just when a rebellious youth culture with fervent dreams of a peaceful, egalitarian, post-scarcity society was booming all around them. In March 1967 the two met again after Marcuse spoke at the School of Visual Arts, telling his hearers that the totalitarian nature of the United States easily absorbs all nonconformist activities and anesthetizes dissent. The only hope for changing this society lay in an art that assumes a position of protest, denial, and refusal. Once again, Bookchin tried to speak past his pessimism and call his attention to the new possibilities for a liberatory, ecological, and decentralized society. Bookchin had remained on good terms with the anarchist painter Ben Moria, despite their disagreements. Sometime in 1966 Moria formed a small group called Black Mask, as if to embody Marcuse's SVA call for an art of protest, denial, and refusal. An art that changed society Black Mask held, had to exist outside museums and be integrated into everyday life. Hence its members produced poster-sized broadsheets that featured extravagant drawings with captions like The Proletarian Revolution is the Sexual Revolution, and The Revolution is Sexuality Trampling Civilization. Black maskers plastered them onto walls around the Lower East Side, where they became a familiar sight. Increasingly, some of the New York Federized dreamed of leaving New York and moving to the countryside. In 1966 they paid a visit to the School of Living at Hethcote, an intentional community in rural Maryland. Founded in the 1930s by Ralph Borsodi and now led by Mildred Loomis, the School of Living taught cooperative lifeways, communal land ownership, and self-sufficiency. The New Yorkers learned that they too could form a rural commune, where they could cultivate the soil together, produce their own food, and live self-sufficiently without much money. The visit was a transformational revelatory experience, its atmosphere akin to that of a church camp or revival or music festival. The Federized decided to go ahead and do it. They chose a rundown 450-acre farm in upstate New York, near Hobart, and named it Cold Mountain Farm. A group of the Federized would go there and farm communally organically and send fresh vegetables back to the rest of the group in New York. Some harbored visions of free love. Murray expected Allen to stay behind in the city with him, but in the spring of 1967 he decided to join Joyce and headed for the countryside. His departure pained Murray and brought a coldness into our relationship that lasted for some time. After they left, Book Chin mulled over the compulsion that had driven half his group to betake themselves to the countryside. The film Mara slash Sada was then showing in New York, and as he listened to the inmates of the Charenton Insane Asylum singing about copulation amid the bloodshed of revolutionary France, he pondered the question of expanding the revolutionary project to include sexual desire. The problem of need, the economic agony of the masses, would have to be solved by social revolution, while desire, individual pleasure and sensuality, could be answered by private satisfaction. But desire and need were not in contradiction, because both are necessary for full human liberation. People in revolutionary situations historically demanded both the filled belly and the heightened sensibility. For the hippie culture of the Lower East Side, the problem of need had been solved by the technology-generated affluence of post-war America, 
and if the neighborhood now floated on a sea of sex and drugs, so had revolutionary Paris of 1793, which floated on a sea of alcohol, for months everyone in the Belleville district was magnificently drunk. Still, the counterculture's new apotheosis of the individual self, he warned in his essay Desire and Need, must not be taken to such an extreme that people give up on social action. For without social action, the self contracts to banalities and trivia and takes a placid journey inward. Just at that moment, in March 1967, two members of the New York Federation who had declined to go to Cold Mountain Farm decided to join the Situationists, a group of artists and poets based in Paris. Since the 1950s, the Situationists had been criticizing the post-war cityscape, a long line similar to Book Chin's, calling it dehumanizing and anonymous and banal and gigantic. But where Book Chin offered a program, Echo Decentralism, to contest and replace it, the Situationist solutions were more fleeting, taking boulevard strolls without a destination, bringing art into the fabric of everyday life, and creating transient situations and eruptive acts, such as building occupations, street demonstrations, guerrilla theater, and graffiti. Such detournements would transform everyday life momentarily, if not in any lasting way. The Situationists had recently formed an international, SI, and Tony Verlon, an official representative of the SI, had arrived from Paris to form the American section, it was he who recruited the two Federais. Between Cold Mountain Farm and Situationism, Book Chin felt his group evaporating. Rather than mourn another loss, he decided to go to Europe to investigate the political scene there. He'd been told that in Europe, too, disaffected children of affluence were rejecting consumerism and yearning for a revolutionary transformation of everyday life. Perhaps he could bring them together into an international anarchist movement. So in mid-August 1967 he boarded a plane for Paris. Upon his arrival, he spent a day with his friend Judith Molina of the Living Theatre, explaining that he wanted to build up an anarchist program and consolidate anarchist tendencies on both continents. She found him full of grace and openness. He visited members of the French Anarchist Federation, a small group of old-time anarcho-syndicalists, as well as Noir et Rouge, a group of younger anarchists. But old and young, in that summer of 1967, the French anarchists all told him the same thing, as far as radical politics was concerned, France, same ort. And indeed, compared to the growing social uproar over the Vietnam War back home, Paris did seem eerily quiet. In Amsterdam, Book Chin went looking for the Provos, another youth movement, whose reputation for happenings, theatrical gestures and performance art had crossed the Atlantic. A philosophy student named Roel van Duijen had founded the Provos back in 1965, based on the idea that artists, dropouts, street kids, juvenile delinquents, and beatniks could create a viable alternative to capitalist society. Van Duijen wanted to awaken their latent instincts for subversion and channel them into revolutionary consciousness and anarchist action. The Provos called for banning automobiles from the inner city and setting up a system of white painted bicycles to be shared, gratis, for urban transport. Many members of the Dutch public sympathized with them, so much so that the provost became superficially popular, even among the bourgeoisie. The founders considered such widespread acceptance intolerable and in the spring of 1967 declared the death of Provo. Book Chin arrived a few months later to find Amsterdam, too, quiet. Returning to Paris, Book Chin visited, or was granted an audience with, the principal situationists, Guy Debord, Raoul Van Agem, and Mustafa K.A.T. They too, were depressed about the placid French political situation. Murray tried to give them hope. He told them about anarchism, but they weren't interested. He told them about the counterculture and the huge impact it was having in the States, but the Frenchmen dismissed it as politically regressive and petty bourgeois. Finally he told them about the sleeper issue, ecology, people weren't yet complaining much about deforestation, or air and water pollution, or chemicals in agriculture, or the destruction of topsoil, but they would, sooner or later. 
but that only led to more derision, the situationists mocked Book Chin as Smokey the Bear. He concluded with a shrug that they were not serious politically, they were basically literary. Book Chin had a second reason for coming to Europe. The Spanish anarchist revolution of 1936-37, with its confederations and collectives, had been a high point in radical history, but no good study of the Spanish anarchist movement existed. He had decided to write that book himself. Surviving veterans of the 1936 Spanish Revolution, CNTFAI men, were still alive, living as expatriates in France. He would track them down and interview them, starting at a meeting of the CNT in Paris. Sure enough, there he met veterans of 36 who told him about the fiery anarchist proletariat of Saragossa, the authentic black flag center of the movement. He asked many of them about the Grupos de Afinidad that Russell Blackwell had mentioned, and they explained these close-knit, non-hierarchical groups for political action. After hearing their tales, he resolved that the magnificent Spanish working class must never be forgotten. He came across Gaston Laval, a historian, who answered his questions about the revolution's industrial and agricultural collectives. He met Pablo Ruiz, veteran of a militia column of 15,000 Barcelona workers known as the Durruti Column. As they marched northwest to the Aragon front to fight Franco, they had spread social revolution through the Catalan countryside. At one point, someone introduced Book Chin to Cipriano Mera, commander of the anarchist troops in Madrid. Murray had thought he was dead, but here he was, standing before him in a long blue army overcoat. They sat down together in a Parisian bistro, where Mera detailed for him the organizational structure of the anarchist militias, using salt and pepper shakers to illustrate their maneuvers. Pablo Ruiz, the Durruti column veteran, told Book Chin how stunned he had been by the CNT leadership's betrayals of 1936. Late that year the Popular Front had invited the anarcho-syndicalist union to join the government, and to the horror of the anarchist rank and file the leaders had accepted. That meant they agreed to collaborate not merely with the hated nation-state, that would have been bad enough, but with their arch-enemies the Spanish Stalinists, who were part of the Popular Front coalition. Aghast, Ruiz had helped found a militantly anti-statist grupo called the Friends of Durruti. The Friends at their peak had had only about 250 members, Ruiz explained, but their periodical, El Amigo del Pueblo, had been widely read. By adhering to anti-statist principle at a time when the CNT leaders were abandoning it, Book Chin thought admiringly, they had upheld the honor of Spanish anarchism. Ruiz told Murray about the momentous May 1937 uprising of the Barcelona proletariat, in which he had personally participated. It had been mind-boggling, government troops, including Stalinists, aided by the treacherous CNT leadership, had reduced anarcho-syndicalist Barcelona to a shambles. Suppose the uprising had prevailed, Book Chin asked Ruiz, and the anarchists had regained control of Barcelona. What would you have done? Ruiz exclaimed, we would have marched to Valencia, the temporary Republican capital, and kicked those bastards out. The answer was superb in its nerviness. Ruiz and the other militants, Book Chin felt, knew the meaning of principled commitment. And even after three decades, their political passion remained unabated. Their viewpoint on the Spanish Revolution, including their hatred of the CNT leadership's collaboration, would become his position as well, and that of the book he was planning. Traveling south, Book Chin met Jose Pirates in Toulouse a tailor who was also the author of an important three-volume history of the anarcho-syndicalist confederation. Pirates welcomed Book Chin warmly, he too was self-educated, having dropped out of school at twelve. During their conversations, Pirates unscrambled for Murray the complicated organizational structure of the CNT and the FAI. Book Chin then crossed the border into Spain itself, where Franco, the general who had destroyed the greatest proletarian revolution in history, still held power. Walking the Ramblas in Barcelona, Book Chin mentally reconstructed the May 1937 uprising, he knew the positions of the various militias and the Stalinist forces, even down to individuals. 
when he got up close to building walls, he could still see the bullet holes. But Spain was no longer the same country. The Rambles was filled with as many American-style attaché cases as lunch boxes. In Andalusia, once an anarchist heartland, the houses had television antennas. Residents seemed to have forgotten the anarchist history that he was researching, or to have suppressed their memories of it. When he stepped into a bookshop and asked the elderly proprietor for material on the anarchist as the man's face turned pale his eyes anxious. But after a pause he held up a finger, indicating that Bookchin should wait, and went into a back room. After a few minutes, he returned with some material retrieved from a hiding place, then handed it over. The fear that Murray saw in people's eyes caused him to re-examine what he was doing, and he decided that it would be imprudent to continue the research I had planned. Now that he was a published author, the Spanish authorities could easily figure out who he was, and he didn't want to endanger anyone in Spain by association with him. So he cut his trip short and returned home in mid-November. Back in New York, he discovered, lo and behold, that Alan Hoffman had returned from the countryside. Murray must have been delighted to see his protege. But what happened to Cold Mountain Farm? He asked. The farmhouse turned out to be more isolated than we expected, Alan explained, and it was more primitive, it had no electricity. The would-be members of the rural commune were inexperienced farmers, they didn't plant their crops until the weather warmed up, by which time it was too late in the season. They had bought a tractor, but it broke down. At first the group members had lived together. Some practiced casual nudity working outdoors all day. But the neighboring farmers got upset and turned against the hippies. Some commune members drifted away new people arrived, and the unstable population made it impossible to organize household tasks. A hepatitis epidemic struck. Joyce and Alan broke up. Finally the local health inspector demanded that they install electricity, refrigeration, and indoor plumbing, including a toilet, but they couldn't afford it. Stranded in a hostile environment, they declared the experiment over and left. Murray was glad to be reunited with Alan, and the two of them resumed their close friendship. Alan was starved for some kind of theoretical stimulation, Murray noticed, so he showed him the situationist articles he'd picked up in Europe, including Totality for Kids, a translation of an essay by Rahul Van Ajem. Alan loved the article, in fact, it inspired him to write one, combining as always his own ideas with ideas he got from Book Chin, and now with Van Ajem's as well. The goal of revolution, Alan wrote, is the liberation of the entirety of daily life, for in our time the revolution will be total or it will not be. He called the piece 18 Rounds of Total Revolution, an unusual title for a pacifist, and signed it the Totalist. Just then the situationist author himself, Van Asium, arrived in New York. Alan naturally asked to meet him. Van Asium agreed, and he read 18 rounds, but he wasn't impressed, Alan had misunderstood him, he complained. And after meeting Alan, he dismissed him as a mystic and an acid head. Then Ben Moria sought an audience with Van Asium, understandably since Black Mask's broadsheets were a situationist-style detournament in their own right. But Van Asium refused to meet him. Baffled, Moria sat down and wrote a letter to Guy Debord, demanding an explanation. The letter he got in response explained that he had been rejected because of his friendly relations with the mystic Alan Hoffman. Meanwhile Bookchin had personally met with Van Asium, defended Moria to him, and urged him to reconsider. His appeal did not go over well, not at all. On December 21, 1967, the Situationist leadership in Paris thundered a denunciation of Book Chin, Confusionist Cretan, your suspicious efforts to act as mediator in New York in favor of pathetic Moria and his mystical associate have finished you off. You are only spit in the horrible communitarian soup. Never more hope to meet a situationist, if you see one, it will be a false one. In another letter they denounced Moria, and in yet another they expelled the SI's whole British section, for the crime of solidarizing with Bookchin and Moria. 
somehow Book Chin managed to survive denunciation by this strange clique. In the next years the Situationists would become ever more notorious for expelling people. Their dogmatic severity contrasted mightily with the saucy high spirits of, say the Dutch provost. The full measure of the degeneration that occurred between 1965 and 1968, Book Chin observed, can be understood by placing these two tendencies in juxtaposition to each other. Allen was a man in crisis. The failure of Cold Mountain Farm and his breakup with Joyce distressed him deeply. Then one day in late 1967 a friend, Walter Coggy, was stabbed to death by burglars who'd entered his apartment. The killers got away clean, the police never found them. Book Chin thought Coggy's unpunished murder was what propelled Allen into a new way of life. He gave up on his long-standing commitment to nonviolence, concluding that it was merely a restatement of Christian ideals in an East Indian, Gandhian, guise and amounted to merely begging the established order to rectify itself. He swung to the other extreme, and became an advocate of revolutionary violence, adopting the motto Armed Love. He took to writing rabid poetry about vengeance, recalled Judith Molina. Even though Alan was in his personal manner extremely gentle sometimes his passion is roused and he jumps up and shouts, you gotta kill them. Other young radicals were making a similar transition, at the same moment. Black activists were abandoning nonviolent resistance, in the face of brutal, seemingly intractable racism. And new leftists found that all their peaceful anti-war protests had accomplished exactly nothing, the United States was still bombing North Vietnam, still destroying villages, still dropping napalm. Nonviolent resistance and bearing moral witness seemed ineffectual. So when France Fanon's 1961 anti-colonial tract The Wretched of the Earth began passing from hand to hand, young radicals eagerly absorbed its lesson that using violence against a dehumanizing oppressor was justifiable as part of attaining manhood. Riots broke out in Watts in August 1965, in Newark and Detroit in 1967, and in many other American cities, young radicals reframed them as instances of revolutionary guerrilla warfare, waged by a colonized people seeking liberation. National liberation struggles were firing the imaginations of activists, black and white. The examples of Mao Zedong and Fidel Castro and Che Guevara taught them a new revolutionary zeal and beckoned them to create two, three, many Vietnams. Above all they admired Ho Chi Minh, for his heroic resistance to imperialist aggression. Some even saluted him as a comrade, shouting at protests Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh slash the NLF is gonna win. When Clark Kissinger, a one-time national secretary of SDS, was asked at his draft board hearing, are you willing to fight in Vietnam, he responded, sure I am, just not on your side. An international revolutionary armed struggle seemed to be underway, Herbert Marcuse lecturing at NYU Law School, told his listeners that the third world constituted the real proletariat, and the developed world constituted the bourgeoisie. And within that international struggle the American wing was the student and black movements. SDS must become a revolutionary organization, argued National Secretary Greg Calvert, and its leadership must function as a steering committee, a vanguard, leading radical whites, urban blacks, and industrial workers to make a socialist revolution in the United States. From Mao's Little Red Book they learned to dare to struggle dare to win. From the film The Battle of Algiers, released in the United States in September 1967, they learned how to wage urban guerrilla warfare. And from Regis Debray's writings they learned to create focos, or small, fast-moving guerrilla groups that would fight in the streets and provoke the government into responding with excessive force, which would generate sympathy among the general population, who would then join the revolutionary struggle. From these pieces, anti-war radicals assembled a new strategy that they called mobile tactics. They put it to work in October 1967 in Stop the Draft Week, an action to shut down the induction center in Oakland, California. Donning motorcycle helmets, they ran into the streets and overturned garbage cans, ripped down fences, stopped traffic, and damaged property. Like third world urban guerrillas, they used walkie talkies and coordinated their actions from command posts. 
they succeeded in shutting the center down for a few hours, and thereby paused the war machine, however briefly. With mobile tactics, they realized, they need not settle merely for protesting the war or bearing nonviolent witness, they could actively disrupt the war machine. They shifted the anti-war movement's goal from protest to resistance. Another stop the draft week was planned, for New York in early December. Thousands of demonstrators converged at the Whitehall Induction Center, near Wall Street. From there would-be guerrillas ran up Broadway and smashed windows and knocked things over, aiming to provoke the police into a confrontation. It worked, on Friday the cops clubbed them in Union Square. Book Chin participated in Stop the Draft Week but as a peaceful protester. He admired the young people's revolutionary zeal, perhaps he saw his younger self in them, but he decided that mobile tactics were mere adventurism, a fight the cops diversion that succeeded mainly in disrupting traffic. Even more dismayingly, he thought, SDS leaders were leading the anti-war and black movements astray, by giving up their vision of participatory democracy in favor of Marxism. The Third World revolutionaries they admired, Mao, Castro, Che, were authoritarians, centralizers, irrelevant to the egalitarian aspirations of American political culture. Book Chin saw it as his task to try to persuade SDS to return to its original participatory democracy program. He organized some old friends into a collective to publish a periodical, Anarchos, which would advance non-authoritarian approaches to revolutionary theory and practice. The first issue contained three of his articles, under his old CI pseudonyms Robert Keller and Lewis Herber, as well as Murray Bookchin. It went to press at the end of December 1967. The fact is, he explained in Revolution in America, that in the United States there is no revolutionary situation at this time and no immediate prospect of a revolutionary challenge to the established order. That being the case the call to urban warfare in the streets is a demagogic exercise in adventuristic sloganeering. On the other hand, the potential for a future revolution is greater here than in any other industrialized country. Among youth and blacks, opposition to the war and to racism was growing into a profound disrespect for established institutions and a hatred of political manipulation. Ordinary Americans were emerging from the inertness of the 1950s and becoming irritated by the war. They had a long-standing cultural suspicion of government and authority. By the millions, they were questioning what is, the actuality of domination and capitalism, and envisioning what could be, the potentiality of freedom, the kind of questioning that Bookchin since the 1950s had thought necessary for a revolutionary movement. Sometime soon, mainstream America might become interested in participatory democracy. But just at this moment, the new left was giving up on democracy and embracing Leninist propaganda. Instead of calling for greater democracy they were emulating Red Guards in their inflexible authoritarianism, their insufferable cadres, and their acrid scorn for the populist impulses of ordinary people. This was no way to achieve freedom. The fact is, Bookchin explained, the American movements are not part of some common international revolutionary struggle. The third world revolutions that the new left admires are taking place in societies that have yet to overcome the problem of scarcity. China, Vietnam, and Cuba are struggling to industrialize, a task the United States and Western Europe achieved long ago. Moreover, Mao and Ho and Castro are not just promoting industrial development, they are forcing it, using dictatorial means. The states they created in the name of socialism aren't really socialist, they are police states, draped in red flags and adorned with portraits of Marx, Engels, and Lenin. Their little red books, invoking socialism, offer only the fraudulent maxims of tyranny. Really, Bookchin said, the best way for American radical youth to help third world peoples would be to make revolutionary change here at home. Don't cop out by hiding under hose and mouse skirts, he implored, when your real job is to overthrow domestic capitalism. The new left must see speaking German, that is, Marxism, and Russian, that is, Leninism. It must cease propounding the absurd notions that the whole third world is the proletariat, and that college students are workers, 
and that third world dictators represent liberation. Rather, they must talk to Americans in their own terms, appealing to their indigenous discontents and aspirations. Americans were demanding the self-realization of all human potentialities in a fully rounded, balanced, totalistic way of life. Meanwhile modern technology was making it possible for them to achieve a civilization of unprecedented freedom. That technological potential was overripe, like hanging fruit whose seeds have matured fully the structure may fall at the lightest blow. Americans had utopian dreams, radicals must give them a utopian vision, based on their issues. Given their deep suspicion of government, Americans were much more likely to respond to the language of anarchism than to Marxism and to join a movement that tried to end hierarchy and domination. If and when the revolution comes to the United States, he said, it will not be created by a Marxist-Leninist vanguard. It will emerge spontaneously from below, by a molecular movement of the masses. It will seek to abolish domination by the centralized, bureaucratic state, and authoritarianism of all kinds including racial and sexual, in order to emancipate the spontaneous individual, the creative personality, and the diverse eco-community. It will try that is, to dissolve hierarchy as such. At most, revolutionaries may act as catalysts but never as commissars. The moment of confrontation will in fact involve no confrontation at all, because at that point defenders of the old order will have vanished, leaving its institutions available for the revolutionaries simply to seize. If the United States and Europe were to undergo such a libertarian revolution, it would spread abroad, to the Soviet Union and to the rest of Asia. Then the planet as a whole could become eco-anarchist. To achieve a libertarian revolution in America would be the highest act of internationalism and solidarity with oppressed people abroad. After the moment of liberation, societies will need new, democratic institutions, forms of freedom, as he called them in an article by that name. Ancient Athens long ago achieved a popular, face-to-face -face democracy. And revolutionary movements of the past also formed democratic assemblies. In 1789, as the French Ancien Regime was on the brink of collapse the city of Paris was divided into sections, where residents met in ad hoc assemblies to draw up lists of grievances. Once they performed that task, they were scheduled to disband, but the citoyens refused. In the next years, these citizens' assemblies became genuine forms of self-management in the heart of revolutionary Paris, the very soul of the Great Revolution. Young revolutionaries today could create similarly self-managing institutions, embodying the heart of the ethics-laden youth revolt. And because they are of, by, and for the emancipated people they could become the universal solvent, dissolving bureaucracy, war-making state, and hierarchy generally, as well as industrial agriculture and the gigantic city. Buchan's foundational 1960s trilogy, on ecology, ecology and revolutionary thought, technology, towards a liberatory technology, and democracy, the forms of freedom, was published in the first issues of Anarchos. The response was like nothing he had seen before. The mere two or three thousand copies that were printed circulated widely passed from hand to hand. Letters poured in from young people forming anarchist groups around the country. The times were buoyant, Bookchin recalled decades later, what a time to live. To Murray's disappointment, Allen didn't join the Anarchos Collective. In early 1968 he decided that the time for theorizing and writing and publishing was over. He would become an urban guerrilla and try to make the street into the arena of social change. He transformed himself as Book Chin described it, from the rustic to the tough urban street person. And in the streets, he suddenly found Ben Moria, whom he'd once detested, and Black Mask, with its provocative broadsheets, to be fascinating. He joined the other artistically-minded radicals who were also making their way into Moria's orbit. In February 1968, the city's sanitation workers went on strike. Wealthy New Yorkers hired private haulers to remove their refuse, but on the Lower East Side mounds of garbage piled up on the sidewalks and spilled into the streets. Rats were having a field day, recalled Osha Newman. One evening, 
disgusted by the city's inaction, Moria and his friends stuffed some stinking, rotting refuse into large plastic bags, boarded the uptown subway, and got off on the Upper West Side, where the glittering new Palace of Culture, Lincoln Center, welcomed elite patrons dressed in their finest. Moria and friends approached the illuminated fountain and emptied some of the trash into it, then dumped the rest on the marble steps. The leaflet they distributed read, We propose a cultural exchange, garbage for garbage. And it was signed, Up Against the Wall Motherfucker, a line from a poem by Amory Baraka. That signature became the new group's name. UAWMF was Black Mask on an expanded scale a street gang with analysis. Its florid broadsheets featured skeletons, skulls, and smoking guns and bore captions like We are the ultimate horror show and armed love striking terror into the vacant hearts of the plastic mother and pig-faced father. One poster reproduced a picture of Geronimo holding a 30 caliber lever-action rifle, over the caption, We're looking for people who like to draw. The motherfuckers wore leather jackets and clicked open folding knives with one hand, recalled Newman. While the counterculture talked of peace and love, we talked of rage, its reality in us and the dangerous rage of society against us. Anarchos and the motherfuckers maintained friendly relations. Book Chin viewed their violence as basically rhetorical, believing that their main job was to blow people's minds. But Alan the poet was now positively attracted to these artistic street rebels, whose totalistic vision fused revolutionary and economic consciousness with liberation of the unconscious, the psychological project, and artistic reconstruction of life. Murray warned Alan that the motherfuckers mostly practiced street theater, Moria thought he could incite people to a revolution with artistic antics, but street theater rarely makes people think, and it can get out of control and undermine serious organizations. Above all, it could make you lose sight of politics, which had to be the top priority. However personalized, individuated, or Dada-esque may be the attack upon prevailing institutions, a liberatory revolution always poses the question of what social forms will replace existing ones, that is, what concrete institutions, what forms of freedom. Art cannot answer that question. Serious revolutionary thought must speak directly to the problems and forms of social management. But by this time Alan was already within Moria's circle sympathizing with UAWMF on a gut, generational level. The thing that pushed Alan toward us, Moria told me, was that we were part of the youth rebellion. We used drugs rampantly. We saw LSD as a revolutionary tool. We thought the mind had to be changed as well as the environment. When Alan finally joined the motherfuckers, Murray was stunned. He had given Alan a unique education in revolutionary history and theory, and Alan was setting it aside in favor of street theater. In the spring of 1968, Columbia University announced its plans to build a large gymnasium in Morningside Park, which was used mainly by blacks in neighboring Harlem. On April 23 student radicals, in outraged protest, marched into Hamilton Hall, occupied it, and renamed it Malcolm X Hall. Others took over Low Library and occupied the university president Grayson Kirk's office. It is the opening shot in a war of liberation, SDS leader Mark Rudd wrote to Kirk. Up against the wall, motherfucker, this is a stick-up. A thousand students liberated three more buildings, barricaded themselves inside, created communes, and held discussions on politics, society ideology, and the role of the university. Bookchin admired the students for shedding the internalized structure of authority the long-cultivated body of conditioned reflexes, the pattern of submission sustained by guilt that tie one to the system. He saw them as courageous and beautiful. On April 25 some conservative student-athletes tried to blockade a building to keep food from getting through, Book Chin participated in a defense squad to prevent them. On April 30, at President Kirk's insistence, a thousand city police arrived and began to arrest students, who surrendered peacefully, although some yelled up against the wall, motherfucker. Students and faculty stood before the occupied buildings, attempting to block the arrests non-violently the cops brought out billy clubs and brass knuckles and rioted, injuring more than 100. 
bleeding students were dragged to paddy wagons. Thereafter students went on strike, the administration shut the university down. The student occupation and the police repression that it provoked could have come out of Debray's and Fanon's playbooks for urban guerrillas. It gave rise to a new revolutionary strategy. Radical students would occupy more university buildings and build strong barricades. Police would be unable to overcome the barricades, and the universities would have to shut down, as Colombia had. The government would send troops to restore order. Then the rebellion would spread to the cities, where black militants would join the students, and the Black Panthers would mount guerrilla rebellions. The crisis would be so massive that the police could not vanquish it. Having no alternative, the government would finally have to end the war in Vietnam. This was the strategy in pursuit of which Tom Hayden, echoing Che Guevara, called for two, three, many Columbias. A university's only function now, announced SDS leader Mark Rudd, was the creation and expansion of a revolutionary movement. Book Chin, aghast, recognized that the whole plan was foolhardy. Ordinary Americans were repulsed by posters of Mao and Ho and Che and Fidel, and they didn't like cops being provoked. Revolutionary rhetoric and quotations from the Little Red Book would do nothing but drive them away. Even as Book Chin was writing such words, students in France were doing more or less what he was advocating. In the early spring of 1968, students at Nanterre University occupied school buildings, protesting the university's bureaucratic structure and its archaic curriculum. On May 2 the administration shut the school down. The next day, in Paris, students rallied outside the Sorbonne to protest the Nanterre closing. In the late afternoon, black vans pulled up, carrying the paramilitary riot police called CRS. The students attacked the vans with fists and rocks, overturning cars and creating makeshift barricades. The CRS responded with tear gas and truncheons. The battle continued into the following week. On Friday, May 10, students ripped paving stones from the streets and piled them up to make several dozen new barricades. After midnight the CRS attacked with more tear gas and smoke bombs. Neighborhood people living above the barricades helped the students by pouring water from their windows to douse the gas, they dropped flowerpots onto the police below. At daybreak the police fired gas grenades and dispersed the students. A national outpouring of sympathy for the student rebels followed, they had courageously taken on the much-hated CRS. On May 13 one million people thronged the streets of Paris in support. The government yielded, reopening the Sorbonne and releasing four students from jail. Students then occupied the Sorbonne, hoisted the red flag, and declared it a people's university. They turned it into a 24-hour debating forum, insurrectionary headquarters and revolutionary commune. Throughout the left bank, students plastered walls with posters bearing slogans like power to the imagination, it is forbidden to forbid, be realistic, demand the impossible, and we take our desires to be reality because we believe in the reality of our desires. Even the Prime Minister, Georges Papidou, understood that our civilization is being questioned, not the government, not the institutions, not even France, but the materialistic and soulless modern society. Then industrial workers went on strike, again in sympathy for the students. On May 14 in Nantes workers occupied the Sud Aviation plant. Farmers came from the countryside on tractors and joined them, for a week a revolutionary Soviet ran Nantes. The general strike spread to Paris, shutting down banks, post offices, insurance firms, and department stores. The strikers' grievances, remarkably did not involve wages and working conditions, they complained, rather, about the alienated atmosphere in factories and workplaces and the bureaucratized society. It was not only a workers' strike, Book Chin would observe, it was a people's strike that cut across almost all class lines. The media reported on the strike sympathetically. It swept to other major French cities and to the manufacturing, mining, utilities, and transport sectors. Workers occupied factories. Stores, teachers, civil servants, and physicians walked off their jobs. 
reaching 9 million workers by May 22, it was the largest general strike in French history. Bookchin was champing at the bit to get there, but because the transport workers were on strike, no planes were landing at Orly Airport. On May 27 the government offered large increases in wages and fringe benefits and half pay for strike time. Rank and file workers rejected it, and the general strike continued. On May 30 President Charles de Gaulle dissolved the National Assembly and announced new parliamentary elections. His party organized large counter-demonstrations, the armed forces conducted ostentatious troop movements. The communists, colluding with de Gaulle to end the revolt, tricked metro workers into resuming operations. The strike wave subsided, and the revolutionary mood waned. On June 16 police cleared the Sorbonne. Two days later the Renault plant surrendered. A week after that, de Gaulle's party triumphed in the parliamentary elections. Finally, on July 13, Bookchin arrived in Paris. The streets had been repaved, and the graffiti was painted over. CRS loitered in full battle gear, some carrying submachine guns. On the eve of Bastille Day, he marched with a crowd of Africans to the Rue de Madeleine, singing the Internationale. The CRS chased them into the Rue Soufflot, he escaped near the Pantheon. Street fighting flared up sporadically during that night. Bookchin spent the next few weeks interviewing leaders of the student uprising, to find out what had happened, and how, and why. In hitherto quiescent Paris, Saint-Mort, the May-June uprising had surprised the whole left, be it Marxist, anarchist, or situationist, it had emerged spontaneously without leadership. It had had majority support, based on no single class. Structurally it had been, in a word, anarchic. Students had exercised self-management, in general assemblies, action committees, and strike committees. The Sorbonne Assembly had been non-hierarchical and open to all, on the principle that the direct entry of the people into the social arena is the very essence of revolution. The students had made decisions by finding the sense of the assembly. The strikers' grievances were less about material issues than about the character of modern society. Young people saw bleak lives stretching out ahead of them, empty of meaning, geared toward routine work and the consumption of useless, shabby goods, their elders despaired that their lives fulfilled precisely that expectation. But the opportunity to rebel called forth their passions and aroused their senses, a fever for life gripped millions. Tongues were loosened, ears and eyes acquired a new acuity. Many factory floors were turned into dance floors. Repressed people demanded the liberation of experience. The tenor of the revolt was creative, even artistic, as reflected in the clever graffiti book Chin saw. As for the Marxist-Leninist groups, of which Paris had several, the naive observer might expect them to have scrambled to support the uprising, but in fact they had played a retarding or even counter-revolutionary role. Virtually every one of these vanguard groups, Book Chin noted, disdain the student uprising up to May 7. The Trotskyists and the Maoists had criticized the student revolt as peripheral, the Trotskyists had condemned its street actions as adventuristic. Once the general strike erupted, the Maoists had opposed demands for workers' control and occupation of factories. Not a single Bolshevik-type party in France raised the demand for self-management, he reported. The demand was raised only by the anarchists and the situationists. The communists, who controlled the powerful industrial trade union CGT, joined the revolt only to try to retard it, Bookchin maintained, using trickery and deceit. In the Sorbonne Assembly their machinations had interrupted the democratic proceedings and thereby demoralized the entire body. In workplaces, instead of promoting the general strike, they had tried to dampen the enthusiasm and even sent some factory workers home. They had attempted to keep the students and workers apart. They told metro workers at some subway stations, untruthfully, that others were going back to work, to induce them to give up. Bookchin called their actions shameless and treacherous. He wrote up his findings in a series of letters, enough to fill an entire special issue of Anarchos. But the collective didn't have enough money to publish such an edition, 
so New Left Notes and The Rat published several of them, and the new underground press around the country picked them up. When he returned to New York on August 1st, Book Chin was shocked to find that the Meijun evenements had hardly registered on the American New Left. But in retrospect, the reason was clear, the French general strike had taken place in a Western, industrialized country and its outlook had not coincided with Marxist ideology. And Marxist ideology was now de rigueur among the New Left's leadership. On June 9-15, at an SDS national conference in East Lansing, Michigan, pictures of Lenin and Trotsky had hung on the walls. In the plenary, two sets of Marxist-Leninists glowered at each other from across the room in mutually seething hatred. One was progressive labor, its clean-cut Maoists present in force, disciplined and unwaveringly self-assured. The other was a group of Marxists who preferred Cuba to China, organized by the Bernardine Dorn of the SDS National Office to counteract PL. Both groups wore red armbands and raised clenched fists. PL promoted its ideas aggressively at the conference, pushing its line in every plenary and workshop. Whenever a regular SDS militant made a proposal, PL introduced a ratcheted up counter proposal, they waved their little red books at every juncture. They resisted all suggested compromises and counter arguments. Unprepared intellectually to rebut PL or offer a coherent alternative, Dorn's group simply competed in revolutionary braggadocio, motions from the floor outdid one another in their claims to be revolutionary. Someone from Dorn's group attempted to expel PL on the grounds that it was an external cotter, PL dug in its heels and screamed that that was red baiting. Dorn's people on the floor chanted PL out, but the PL delegates sat immobile. They successfully obstructed every move to sideline them. In July 1968 the well-known anarchist Paul Goodman, whose writings had helped to inspire the Port Huron Statement, published an article in the New York Times magazine berating the SDS leadership for embracing Marxism and for manipulating the youth revolt's lively energy and moral fervor. At the time, Book Chin was still trying to persuade the new left to abandon Marxism in favor of anarchism. He felt Goodman's prominent article made that task more difficult, so he chastised Goodman publicly in the rat, in a piece signed in control Leto but Buchin's efforts to promote anarchism were not bearing much fruit. In November 1968, writing in New Left Notes, Huey Newton, co-founder of the Black Panthers, explained why he rejected it, anarchists were disorganized and unruly. You cannot oppose a system such as this is, he said, without organization that's even more disciplined and dedicated than the structure you're opposing. Newton called instead for a real, disciplined vanguard movement. Newton's piece cut to the heart of the matter. Book Chin wrote a response arguing that, contrary to popular belief, anarchists were no strangers to organization, most notably the Spanish anarchists had maintained their trade unions for decades. The relevant issue wasn't organization as such but what kind, authoritarian or libertarian, top-down or bottom-up. The Spanish anarchists, however, were all but unknown in the United States, especially to the young people around him. So Book Chin spent the rest of 1968 working on his book on the largest organized anarchist movement to appear in our century. It would be a history of that movement but also an argument for anarchism as an ideology and an illustration of an alternative, enlightened, non-hierarchical way for the new left and the counterculture to organize themselves. The Spanish anarchists' trade unions had been organized, indeed, intricately elaborately. In individual shops, factories, and agricultural committees, workers in assemblies had elected from their midst the committees that preside over the affairs of the sect Chianesta Officio and the Federacionese locales, these were federated into regional committees of nearly every geographic area of Spain. The local federations mandated their delegates to CNT congresses, a practice that kept them accountable to the base and kept the movement democratic. The Spanish anarchists' sophisticated training in organization bore fruit in July 1936, when they made their revolution to gain full, direct, face-to-face -face control over their everyday lives, to manage society as thoroughly liberated individuals. They collectivized factories and farms, they established councils and committees to function as local self-government, 
they set up armed patrols to serve as police, and they formed militias to defend the revolution against the generals. This was organization indeed, melding structures of the traditional village with those of modern industry. At the same time, the Spanish anarchists resembled the 1960s counterculture in their lifestyle changes, their spontaneity and their fondness for initiative from below, and in their anti-hierarchical outlook. They too, wanted to develop integral, in the sense of authentic and well-rounded, personalities. The Spanish anarchists' unit of revolutionary organization, as opposed to institutions of governance, was the affinity group, a small action group whose bonds were both political and personal. Murray had learned about affinity groups from Russell Blackwell and from the Spanish anarchists he interviewed in France in 1967. Affinity group members were friends and comrades who shared common revolutionary ideas and practice. As a way of organizing, Bookchin thought, the affinity group should be of particular interest to the new left, it was the anarchist answer to the Marxist-Leninist vanguard. Marxist vanguards attempted to constitute a movement's command center, coercing uniformity but affinity groups acted as catalysts within the spontaneous revolutionary movement of the people. While vanguards were hierarchical, affinity groups were local and could confederate regionally for joint action. While vanguards commanded and coerced, affinity groups achieved coordination through education and the formulation of common policies. While vanguards sought to seize power, affinity groups sought to dissolve it. In August 1968, the New Left's urban guerrillas and the Chicago police waged their climactic battle at the Democratic National Convention. Radical youth turned over garbage cans and pounded on cars. They threw bottles and rocks, bricks, eggs, chunks of concrete and urine-filled balloons. Police responded by clubbing indiscriminately, beating protesters unconscious, and rioting, they cracked skulls and broke knees for 20 minutes. If the new left strategy had been to provoke, the use of force by the police was excessive beyond anyone's wildest predictions. But as Book Chin predicted, it did not arouse sympathy in mainstream Americans, in fact, it appalled them. Even many who opposed the Vietnam War thought the Chicago cops had been too restrained, had used insufficient force against the protesters. Ordinary Americans, it turned out, hated the protesters more than they hated either the atrocious war or the thuggish cops. In fact, anti-war protesters were by now the most despised political group in the country. But the SDS leaders in the national office were not listening, they ratcheted up their own Marxist zeal to counter that of PL. In December they proposed that SDS should no longer be a student movement, it should become an organization for working class youth called Revolutionary Youth Movement, RYM. Their vision was all but indistinguishable from PL's program for a worker-student alliance. They differed only on the issue of black nationalism, PL opposed all nationalism as reactionary and bourgeois, while RYM said that in the United States the Black Panthers were the revolutionary vanguard and that SDS must develop disciplined Cotter to support them. The RYM and PL would wage their own climactic battle for the soul of SDS at its ninth annual convention, to start on June 18, 1969, at the Chicago Coliseum. In advance, Book Chin wrote a long essay called Listen, Marxist, in an effort to break the Marxist-Leninist spell that had such a powerful hold on both factions. All the old crap of the 30s is coming back again, he began with confidence born of experience. Marxism, with its fantasies of proletarian dictatorship, belonged to the past, he continued, and good riddance. Its cadres and vanguards had done nothing more than seek power for themselves, then maintain it at any cost. During the revolutionary ferment of 1917 in Russia, workers had organized themselves into relatively democratic factory councils, called Soviets, which the Bolsheviks had pretended to favor and thereby won the support of the workers. That support had been their stepping stones to power. But once in charge of Russia, they had suppressed dissent and transformed the Soviets into instruments for top-down rule. Marxist-Leninist organizations behaved the same way everywhere, Bookchin argued, they sought above all to build their own organization and to gain power, and they would pursue both goals at the expense of all other considerations, 
including social revolution itself. In Paris a few months earlier, the Bolshevik groups had been prepared to destroy the Sorbonne Student Assembly in order to increase their influence and membership. Today in SDS, PL was trying to do the same thing. He appealed to SDS to look not to the past but to the present, when the revolutionary agent is not the worker but the great majority of society, especially the youth. SDS should resist Marxification, he pleaded, and return to its original anarchistic call for participatory democracy. He also wrote a program for an alternative SDS, called the Radical Decentralist Project, that called on SDS chapters to reconstruct themselves as affinity groups, and to focus on issues of ecology and community. It urged university students to create liberated spaces in the fashion of the Sorbonne and to help the third world, by changing the first. A printer friend ran off thousands of copies, and the Anarchos group loaded them into a truck and drove off to Chicago. At the Coliseum, a huge, barren hall constructed of steel girders and cement blocks, all the SDS politicos were present, the national offices are YM Group, the Black Panthers, and socialists of all different stripes. PL bust in its people from around the country, organized into squads, they constituted about one-third of those present. And mingling among them all were hundreds of plainclothes Chicago police with cameras and assorted other government officials. The Anarchos group set up a literature table with copies of Listen, Marxist, and the Radical Decentralist Project. By the end of the first day, all copies were gone. Clashes between RYM and PL erupted right away. When a speaker said something that PL found objectionable its cadres tossed little red books at him or her. PL would chant, Mao, Mao, Mao Tsedung, while RYM answered with Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh. Then RYM played its trump card, its alliance with the Black Panthers. Rufus Walls, Minister of Information from the Illinois Black Panther Party took the mic and declared that the Panthers were the true vanguard because while the white left was sitting comfortably in armchairs, the Panthers were out in the streets shedding blood. Walls denounced PL, in what RYM hoped would be a fatal blow. He continued by saying that the Panthers supported women's liberation, and believed in pussy power. The room gasped, then the PLERS started chanting, fight male chauvinism. RYM was mortified but recovered enough to send female Panther leader Jewel Cook out to the mic to try to salvage the situation. She delivered an ultimatum to PL, its members had to change their politics and support the Panthers, or else get their privileged white behinds out of SDS. PL didn't bat an eye. Refusing to be bullied, it switched its chant to smash red baiting, and read Mao. Against them, RYM and its supporters cried power to the people. PL came back with power to the workers. Amid the screaming, National Office and RYM member Bernardine Dorn rushed onto the stage and took the mic. PL, she said, by virtue of its failure to support the Panthers, was objectively racist. It was up to SDS to decide whether the racist PL was fit political company. Then she initiated a split, anyone interested in helping decide should join her into the next room. PL chanted sit down, sit down, no split, no split. The RYM supporters chanted back join us, join us. 600 delegates followed Dorn out of the room, where they voted to expel PL from SDS. Dorn came back into the main hall and delivered their verdict, PL was no longer part of SDS. PL was stunned into momentary silence. Then its members began to shout, shame. Dorn's contingent cried, power to the people and, ho 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 chi Minh, as they went out into the night. By now Bookchin had found enough sympathizers, alienated by the posturing, to form an anarchist caucus. About 250 met in the old IWW hall nearby and voted to endorse the radical decentralist project as their program. The next morning PL opened its meeting in the main hall, while the RYM groups opened a second convention in a smaller auditorium nearby. Jeff Jones, of RYM, stood before the packed room and announced, 
I hereby declare the opening of the real SDS convention. Who wants the floor? Book Chin leaped to his feet, the first to speak. SDS, he said, had to find a way to win the support of the American people. It shouldn't just denounce America. It had to offer a broad social vision that was ecological and decentralist and anarchist. The people listening cheered, right on, right on. Then someone else stood up to talk and said the opposite of what Book Chin had been saying, and the audience shouted right on, right on. He realized he couldn't achieve anything more here. He and Anarchos would have to organize an alternative movement. They headed for the exits, ready to plan a follow-up meeting. Back in New York, Anarchos invited all the caucus members to the meeting on September 6, 1969, to be held at a campground in West Central Wisconsin called Black River. Once again Book Chin and friends traveled halfway across the continent, this time to develop the radical decentralist alternative. About 80 people showed up, gathering under a big outdoor canvas tent. Book Chin wondered, when he saw the tent, if that venue would really be conducive to the serious work at hand. He wondered the same thing when the local organizers insisted that the participants sit in a circle, so as to be non-hierarchical, and speak one after the other, going around the circle. What was needed, Book Chin thought, was a back-and-forth discussion of issues and courses of action. But the artificial, circular structure made that impossible. People said whatever was on their mind, without response or consequence. The meeting deteriorated into irrelevant words, rhetoric, and exhaustion. The underground press, the Black River conferees were told, was waiting for them to issue a statement. Movement newspapers all over the country would publish it, and millions of readers would see it. Book Chin told the conferees that the Anarcho's policy statement was available but the conferees said they preferred to write their own. A single individual writing a statement would be hierarchical, they said. Rather, the statement must be a collective effort to which each member contributed. One of the conference organizers had a pet theory that eroticism should have a central place in political proceedings and was hitting on participants to join in some revelry happening elsewhere. The non-hierarchical Black River gathering, needless to say produced no statement. Book Chin and his companeros who had been serious about establishing a libertarian alternative to the now Bolshevik SDS went away empty-handed and disappointed. As for RYM, after Chicago it changed its name to Weather Underground and in 1970 declared war on the federal government. It embarked on a career of bombing ROTC buildings on college campuses, draft board headquarters, army induction facilities, research laboratories, and corporate headquarters. These bombings, which continued for several years, attracted not the slightest sympathy from mainstream Americans. A few months later, in May 1970, the United States invaded Cambodia, and students at universities around the country protested. At Kent State University in Ohio, the National Guard killed four unarmed student demonstrators. Outraged, four million American students went on strike, shutting down more than 900 colleges, universities, and high schools. It was the largest student strike ever in the United States. But mainstream public opinion sympathized not with the students but with the National Guard, 150,000 people paraded for flag and country down New York's Broadway. Again, the majority of Americans who by now opposed the war did so in spite of New Left, not because of it. On the Lower East Side, the utopian hippie counterculture was being displaced by a criminal element. LSD was giving way to heroin. Drug dealers preyed on teenage runaways. Buchan's apartment was burglarized several times. The motherfuckers deteriorated into outright criminality. One day an apartment superintendent, a Puerto Rican, said something disrespectful about the scruffiness of a few passing motherfuckers. The next day some UAWMF street kids came by and stabbed the super to death. We had shouted off the pig, but the first person to die was a Puerto Rican superintendent, Newman, who was not involved in the confrontation with the superintendent, noted ruefully. Soon after, the motherfuckers hightailed it out of New York on a bus, 
shoplifting their way to New Mexico. Out west along the California and Oregon coast, a loose network of communes was being formed, known as Armed Love. Its spiritual center was Black Bear Ranch, in Northern California. That was where Alan Hoffman landed. The setting seems to have calmed him. The future lies with those who return to the land and to communal forms of living together, ready to give it another try. He decided to abandon ideologies and explore Reikian psychology. On September 21, 1970, Alan and some of his friends drove their Dodge Power Wagon into Arcata to get supplies. On the return trip, along a twisting mountain road, Alan was lying in the open back. An 18-wheel lumber truck rear-ended the Dodge, and the impact threw Alan into the air. He landed on his head. Rushed to a hospital, he died a week later. His body was returned to New York, and Book Chin delivered the eulogy at the funeral on Long Island. Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix had recently self-destruct, the Hells Angels had killed someone at a Stones concert at Altamont. But for Murray, it was Alan's death that marked the end of the 1960s. Still, throughout the 1970s he would defend a counterculture, or at least its potential. Yes, its pleas for a vision of love, community material simplicity, and an uninhibited openness and directness in human relationships had surely been naive. But the counterculture had added new ethical and psychological dimensions to traditional socialist theory. Its revolt had been driven by moral outrage, it had linked the psychological and the aesthetic with the social and political. Those dimensions, along with its communal spirit, its trusting open-heartedness, and its sensuality remained necessary to any future utopian vision. The counterculture hadn't died, it remains incomplete as a project, awaiting a richer, more perceptive, and more conscious development.